<laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my research project with you today. Um, since we are in this virtual world, I'll tell you I am in Jackson Heights in New York City. Um, and uh, yep, yeah, and I'm here with my parents and they're they're witnessing this presentation today. I think it's the first one they've seen of this live kind of thing. So it's cool. Zoom is cool. <laughs> Uh, to begin, I would kind of like to try to convince you that my subject is worthy of some attention, and then I will discuss the details of my research and uh, what I view the relevance of it is today, in today's time. So I'm going to um, share my screen because I have some visuals, and then I'll start talking. The exact article in which I read, read the name, Leonor Lopez de Cordova, now eludes me. However, I do remember that it was in a little footnote discovered while studying for an examination in the Wertheim study room, a quiet space for researchers in the main branch of the New York Public Library. That space was conceived of by the Pulitzer Prize winning historian, Barbara Tuckman, who uh, died in 1989. I also recall that the brief entry mentioning the first writer of an autobiography in the Castilian language gave me much pause. I recently just realized that the first autobiography written in English was also written by a woman around the exact same time. I had never heard of Leonor Lopez de Cordoba before. I was already in my fourth year of the doctoral program and the only reason my eyes had kind of strayed to the bottom of the page was because Leonor's last name, because of her last name. I had spent a semester study abroad in Cordoba, Spain, as an undergraduate. Choosing to study Leonor and then subsequent, subsequently other women writers like her was a decision born of the need to reconcile what I know now to be my own misconceptions about what women before felt compelled to do, to create, and to achieve. It has been through my research of these women that, for example, with regard to the struggle of equity and inclusion, the Middle Ages doesn't really seem so quite so distant. And as that venerable historian, the Wertheim study creator, Barbara Tuckman argued in her book on the 14th century, A Distant Mirror, yes, also a serendipitous coincidence, she wrote, the past is most certainly a reflection of our future. As an early graduate student, I had looked into that mirror of the past as displayed by the traditional canon and seen a distorted and subjectivized feminine image looking back at me. However, now after familiarizing myself with the medieval female authored literary production, it has become quite clear that for as long as the daughters of Eve have felt that their identity as women confined them, to borrow from Mary Ellman, they have looked for ways to escape the prison of their gender. Some call this inclination feminism, while others hesitate to use such a contemporary term to refer to the far past. Irrespective of the terminology, clear examples of this sentiment may be found in a diverse body of literature produced by women intent on rejecting the silence imposed on them. In pursuing medieval feminist literature, I was surprised and fascinated by the existence of women who wrote such intriguing and essential texts. There was something inherently comforting to understand that what we now call feminist thought is not at all new, and that women who could muster a voice deemed it important enough to use in order to better their positions and the positions of women like them. My ongoing research of three writers in particular is focused on three remarkable medieval women of the crowns of Castile and Leon, and Aragon, excuse me. <laughs> Leonor Lopez de Corva, as I mentioned, um, Teresa de Cartagena, and Isabel de Viena. These three women understood that to be heard, they would need to resurrect an authorial legacy, a new space within which they could maneuver as agents of influence. 
The reasoning for placing these particular women writers in conversation with one another, because there were others, is that all three writers employed referential and connective teaching techniques in their work. And the result of their efforts, Memorias al Bolivar de los Enfermos and the Vita Christi, respectively, turned out to be highly sympathetic and approachable narratives, relevant to medieval readership, but also fascinating today. Ultimately, I would like to show that these three women wrote self-consciously and deliberately, incorporating their own life experiences in order to affect socio-political change in a time when much was said about them without their input. There was a large and studied corpus of medieval literature, for example, later referred as the querella or the woman question or the querel, um, that was male authors in, you know, they engaged in this question about what is a woman. And the products of their imagination fell on all points of the spectrum in a grand debate centered on morals, values, and the education of women. It is my understanding that, on the contrary, Leonor, Teresa, and Isabel wrote to establish a legacy of female authority and offered their own stories as a hempla, like medieval hempla examples to the next female generation a population even more marginalized and restricted in their intellectual and social pursuits. They could thankfully attain this feat due to a combination of privilege and indignation, <laughs> a fiery mix that offers both the means and the motivation to follow through and challenge the accepted norms. It is my feeling that all three wrote in defiance and despite the accepted male literary culture, and accepted male created definitions and assessment of women. Our writers then were activists and educators. And one approach to continuing their legacy of education is to make their work now, um, make meaning of their work now with the incorporation of digital practices into the more traditional literary analysis of the texts. Specifically, my project involves an evolving um, and ontological digital edition of the text where significant parts are deeply edited, tagged and glossed using a taxonomy of labels. The result is a combination of a highly subjective, highly subjective analysis um, from the ontological value system and thought process of the editor, which is me, <laughs> um, as well as the discoveries that can come from applying this tagging taxonomy. This approach is dialogic in its essence because it acknowledges the exchange of ideas between text and the editor. It also suggests the formation and not just discovery of knowledge. When the contemporary reader scans a medieval manuscript, they kind of peer down at it from a physical and temporal distance as from the top of a spiral. Cultural references to authority, colloquialisms or sayings, even the content itself can, that at times can be con intentionally subversive, may be missed without proper scaffolding. However, the digital edition can bridge this distance and per permit a modern reader or student to at once maintain their own critical eye while submerging themselves in the first person reading experience, kind of pushing that spiral flat, if only for a moment before it springs back once again. It is also hoped that a dialogic digital edition of these texts that can help correct the mirror's defects and better our understanding of the medieval concern with women and their place in society. In my um, screen, my video has stopped. Is that true for uh, yes. everyone? Okay. Um, okay, let's see. I'm gonna turn off my video as so that I can show the images because Okay. Let's stop the share for a minute. Okay. okay. Um, let me introduce you to the women and their work. <laughs> Let's get into it. Um, as I mentioned, Leonor Lopez de Cordoba was my introduction to this world. Um, this is the cover page. Um, of the of a 19th century transcription of the original memorias that, that was actually lost a century before. 
Leonor, a noblewoman whose life transfers civil war, conquest, the black and the black death, is recognized for having written at around the age of 50 years old what has been categorized as the first memoir in the Castilian language, as I mentioned. And it's but it's really no wonder that she did. <laughs> she had a story to tell. Her father was beheaded by Enrique II of Trastamara um, at the Plaza de San Francisco. She, um, at nine years old, uh, she was in the aftermath of her father's assassination. She was uh, imprisoned in the Ataras Atarasanas um, of Seville, which is still standing. You can visit it. This is the image here. This is uh, her tomb now in, in Cordoba. The original building, oh, excuse me, surviving the ordeal um, of this Atarasanas, many of her relatives actually died. In, in her memoir, she tells the story of holding her brother in, in her arms while he is dying, her little, her youngest brother. Leonor um, was able to move forward and she eventually, in her real life, not just in her memoir, she eventually became an important advisor to Queen Catalina of Lancaster, who is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I went ahead, who is imaged here, Queen Catalina of Lancaster. And actually, all three women are connected to this queen in some way, which is quite interesting. Um, but later, she fell out of royal favor, and she was ultimately expelled from the court under threat of beheading. Leonor's memory recounts her family's history, her own life, his life experiences, like she adopted a boy from the Jewish quarter um, after there was the programs of the uh, late uh, 14th century, actually. Um, and um, she had visions of the Virgin Mary. And um, she also tells the story of her loss uh, at the from the bubonic plague, all of the family members that died just skipping through, sorry. The second chronologically of the three women in this project is named Teresa de Cartagena. Like Leonor, Teresa belonged to a powerful family, the Santa Maria Cartagena clan. In this case, the most important family of Jewish converts, conversos of the late Middle Ages. At the time of her birth in 1420, Teresa de Cartagena's father, Pedro de Cartagena, Cartagena, excuse me, already had a distinguished and picturesque career as a knight in the court of Juan II, John II. By 1440, Cartagena had taken up the habit to become a sister of the Cistercian order of Las Huelgas in Burgos. Initially, Teresa and of course her family had every hope that she would become abbess of Las Huelgas, but her plans were completely derailed because by her late twenties, Teresa had also become completely deaf. And because of this, she suffered a period of almost 20 years of great sadness and isolation, which she explains. I'll give you a, sorry, a picture of Las Huelgas. <laughs> and then we're here. Um, this period of interiority she describes in her treatise. And finally, between 1475 and 1476, she writes this first work, Arboleda de los Enfermos, The Grove of the Infirm. And then two years later, <laughs> she's accused of plagiarism and obliged to defend her work, she writes her second treatise, Admiración Operum Dei, Wonder at the Works of God, which is considered the first actual defense of women's writing in Castilian. Um, Christine de Pisan in France, for those of you who are familiar with her, um, predates uh, Teresa's Admiración. This is an image, obviously, of Arboleda de los Enfermos. And finally, born Eleanor de Vienna, Sor Isabel is the first recognized female writer in the Valencian language. The illegitimate offspring of Enrique de Vienna, who is also a powerful erudite and writer in his own right, he's also known for being a womanizer. Um, <laughs> Isabel was orphaned at four years old and the queen, Maria of Castile, took her under her charge and was responsible for her education. At 15 years of age, Isabel joined the Santa Trinitas convent. This, oh, sorry, this is an image of, I can click on it to make it bigger, of um, Isabel de Viena's kind of family. There's some important people there. That's basically was the point of this image. And then um, this is an image of the Santa Trinitas uh, convent. 
founded by her benefactor. Uh, and then in her 30s, she became abbess of the same institution, even despite her illegitimate status, which did cause some protest to her ascension to the position. In addition to tirelessly working to improve the physical spaces of the convent, it was from the privileged position as the leader of the convent that Isabel wrote her magna opus. The Vita Christi. In addition to demonstrating her knowledge of Latin and patristic and classical texts, Isabel's life of Christ departs dramatically from the genre that she focuses her, um, because she focuses her attention on the many women who played important roles in the birth of the, and life of Jesus Christ. Isabel's account so closely follows the Virgin Mary's life and role as the mother of God that many have called her book a Vita Mariae instead of a Vita Christi. Isabel used her Vita to teach the nuns under her tutelage about life at large and to dispel misconceptions about the virtues of the Virgin and definitely by extension, all women. Isabel died in 1490, succumbing to the plague uh, just before she finished the Vita Christi. However, her work was pub published posthumously by her successor at the behest of Queen Isabel of the Catholic Monarchs, the Catholic Queen Isabel. It was, it was one of the books listed in her library. Now that you've been introduced to our three writers, I can explain my work of bringing them together in conversation in a digital format. The distinct benefit of a digital representation and analysis of the women's work is the ability to present multiple texts simultaneously. A hypertext edition is really the only current format that can truly present the different texts in a decentralized, non-hierarchical manner, while at the same time revealing the connections between them. It is also the only format that can simultaneously represent the many layers of intertextuality and external references employed um, in the text. Finally, there are similarities in the women's techniques that when contrasted to each other, provide a wider view of their process of writing as a product of their gendered identity, as well as their efforts to influence future generations. The scholarly digital edition of Memorias Arboleda de los Enfermos and the Vida Christi should propose a possible solution to the editorial problem of how exactly one is to read these three texts as a cohesive group. My approach to the digital edition of the narratives really ended up boiling down to two basic steps, with a third to come. <laughs> the first was the establishment of a system, or in this case, I call it a taxonomy of tags or labels that may be added um, to the transcription of the documents and then used to kind of mine for the content content that they indicate. The second step is the transcription of the documents incorporating the tags right the work of putting the tags into the documents. And then the third step will be the synthesis of the tags across the three works So being able to search for on one tag across all three works. The first two step steps are highly subjective. They are dialogic and a product of the reasoning of the editor engaged in the text. But by reasoning the subjectivity of the, but I'm sorry, but right by recognizing this subjectivity, the work of identification of the shared elements can be presented in a way so that the evolution of the document of the digital image into an edition can be a completely transparent process. There are no secrets of how I how I came up with these conclusions. We are not presenting the truth, rather one possible interpretation of the work that may contribute to our understanding. Hans Walter Gabler, who has written extensively on the subject, suggests that a digital scholarly edition is in fact a production of its editor, of its editor, and therefore the editor is an important agent of the edition as well. He proposes that we view a scholarly edition as a quote, web of discourses, I love that concept, interrelated and of equal standing. The taxonomy of tags was basically developed by considering the process of committing words to the page and the historical and cultural context in which these women are writing. This is what I was thinking of when I came up with my list. Essentially, the tags may provide the reader with evidence that could help answer these questions. When a person sits down to write, do they write without concern or consideration for the eyes that will scan the page after the words are out? 
Or do they pause to think maybe a little bit about the words that will flow from hand to paper and the effect they will have on their audience? What outside forces intend to, um, intended or otherwise exert influence on the words chosen for the text? Finally, did the author have the knowledge when they wrote that their words would be first copied or revised according to a particular convention before meeting a reader? Did they know they would face a census, for example? The categories of tags in this taxonomy were developed in an attempt to answer some of these questions about the writing process, but also with the application of other established theoretical frameworks, other extant digital resources, as well as the edit editor's interpretation of genre, uh, rhetoric, and lexis, which were chosen because they loosely followed the medieval arts of the trivium, dialectic, rhetoric, and grammar. <laughs> And also, lest we forget intertextuality, which I'm gonna discuss in a moment. The main categories, or categories excuse me, of the tags are outlined on this slide. The textual tags, that textual, <laughs> refers to the document itself and are less objective. It's like, you know, there's an extra, there's a mistake here. You know, those are the actual textual references. Um, the interpretive tags are the space I use to insert my own observations, like full sentences. And then the intertextuality is um, when I feel or I notice there's a reference to another text, or even when they reference their own text. I consider that an intertextuality as well. Um, the tags will ultimately identify also both biblical or peripheral religious texts that are mentioned. Some are explicitly quoted and some not so much, but that's the intertextuality. Um, so here you can see a list of the genres that I came up with. And here's where I would love opinions, <laughs> feedback. I came up with this list. Um, Basically, I divided it into clerical and laic, and this has been particularly problematic because there's a lot of overlap. Um, and eventually I may abandon the attempt to distinguish genre in this way, but one of my reasonings was that I felt that it's typically recognized that traditionally women only had access to kind of clerical sources. And so the idea is, did they also use sources that were not necessarily coming out of the church? Um, so these are the these are the genres that I came up with. And then this is my interpretation of rhetoric. Now we know that rhetoric is <laughs> I'm seeing fiend. There's like many, many different rhetorical terms. I'm adding to it as I identify more, but basically these are the ones that are used the most um, in the three texts. Uh, I these are the ones I've observed. And then um, this. Uh, this list I came up with, the Lexis, I came up with um, based on Barbara Hinger's discourse, um, discourse analysis of memorias, in which she's able to decide on the major discursive function of the text by analyzing verbs and nouns and the frequency of their use. She breaks it down grammatically, um, which I thought was fascinating. Okay, coming to kind of the conclusion soon, <laughs> I promise. Um, this is an excerpt from Arboleda de los Enfermos. Um, it's a sample of the XML coding with the tax with my taxonomy added in there. Um, highlighted in bold, you can see three examples of. Um, I'm sorry, highlighted in bold, you can see three examples of the application of the taxonomy. In this particular excerpt, which is the very beginning of her treatise, of uh, Teresa's treatise, I have noted two mentions of the body and one reference to the work itself, which I'm calling meta under the category of intertextuality, because the author is actually referencing her own work, which I consider uh, important. When the XML is converted into HTML, the reader of the manuscript will obviously not see this. Um, they'll see all, not all this business with the tags, they'll, but with a combination perhaps of hover overs, search tools, images, and the like, they'll have access to this back matter somehow. And that, that is my hope. So I, um, yeah, I'll just leave that up there for a second. <laughs> So my job has been, um, oh, you can see like note, respect, H kebab, that's me. <laughs> um, the truth and revealing the truth for others is a theme in this treatise. In this case, that I said it refers to the true state of health as being spiritual. So I add in my little comments that I can also, you know, will be able to mine later on. Or, and 
my hope eventually is that others will too. As I referenced earlier, this project is really a work in progress. Uh, the transcription and taxonomy must now be applied <laughs> to Memorias Arboleda and the Vita Christi. I'm in the process of doing it um, in order to reconstruct these texts and really make meaning of their message. However, the commonalities in the circumstances of the three women, that they pertain to the highest ranks of noble society, that they possess the means to write and that they chose to, they chose to write, and that they each encountered kind of an existential crisis which shook the very foundations of their identity, indicates to me a pattern that's hard to miss. It is my hope that the similarities of circumstance will also translate into an identifiable discourse that will be evidenced by the grouping of the segments of writing indicated by the tags. This information will surely support the claim that the three authors deliberately employed certain strategies unique to their position as powerful yet challenged women. I hope to find what we can intuitively feel reading their work that Leonor, Teresa, and Isabel capitalized on their socio-political positions to simultaneously maintain or improve their standing, ensure that their work be tolerated by the male authority, and ultimately influence other women in similar positions. I am also concerned with the pedagogical application of the edition with regard to the usefulness and usage as a practical matter. The writing, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is really fascinating in its own right if you have a chance to see it. But an open source digital transcription and edition of the work is useful as it can offer a level of accessibility to the text that a printed edition alone cannot do. Digital editions are useful particularly to those currently considered non-traditional students like me who require access to text but may not possess the means or connections necessary to be physically present in the libraries that house the original documents. This edition will enable future readers or researchers, both traditional and non-traditional, to approach the literature from their own perspective, contextualize each text in relation to, to the other and to external sources, and connect the writings through categories of language and content. Essentially, the objective of the transcription is to enable a scholar of the woman's work to search for related themes in the text and easily identify patterns and commonalities within the language and content, thus furthering our communal understanding of the documents through a revisionist and interpretive perspective. Ending. <laughs> Eventually, I would also, it would also be of interest for the interface of the edition to allow for crowdsourced developments to both the taxonomy and the analysis of the text. I want participation. <laughs> thereby not only granting access to non-traditional scholars, but also a space to express their opinions and expertise. In this way, instead of theorizing about the real efforts of those three 15th century writing women, we are amplifying evidence of the transformative and transgressive aspect of their writing in such a way as to extend their influence and reach into the 21st century and deposit their work firmly within the legacy of the struggle for women's self-determination. Thank you very much. And please, I welcome any suggestions, questions, comments you may have. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Holly, for your presentation. Thank you. Now we have around 20 minutes for our question and answer session. I have like three questions, <laughs> but I will let other participants maybe to start the, the discussion. Or I can start with my question. If out of curiosity, you mentioned that uh, these three women writers are connected to the Queen Catalina of Lancaster. Can you explain how these women are connected to the Queen? Okay, if I recall, because this is a, actually a very recent discovery. <clears throat> I think, I believe that Isabel de Villena, um, Maria de, okay, it has to do with family relations. Um, I believe that. Um, Maria de Luna was Queen Catalina, one of her um, grandchildren or daughters. Like they're they're all connected. And then Teresa de Cartagena's connection is a little bit sneaky. Um, her the Teresa Cartagena clan. Perf so Queen Catalina of Lancaster was a co-regent, and they preferred the other side. So they were actually against Catalina of Lancaster. Queen Catalina of Lancaster was a granddaughter of. Um, Pedro de, de, de Cruel, um, Pedro I. And she, um, 
hired or, you know, uh, is a, uh, Leonor Lopez de Cordova um, because Leonor's family were on the Pedro, were, were against the, the Trastamarans, right? So I'm actually in the process of doing this research, I'm trying to decipher um, all the, the um, monarchy's history, which is <laughs> extremely confusing <laughs> and very fascinating. But yes, they're all somehow connected. I mean, and the point is that they all were in the top of the top. They, they couldn't have written in any other circumstance, really, it seems. But I'll get back to you with the answer to that question more specifically. <laughs> yeah, it's just like the Spanish expression, el mundo es un pañuelo. Exacta, oh. Exactamente. The, the world is a Kleenex. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good translation. Um, yeah, Professor Noss, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Holly, very interesting. And uh, just a quick comment about um, the using, adapting, or modifying male discourses. I had a long conversation with uh, you know uh, Professor Kim Yunsu Kim. Uh, and I never asked her this question. Like um, considering these three women, especially Teresa de Cartagena, as a, a main um, uh, Spanish Castilian writer who wrote in Spanish, right? So um, if you look at you know. Uh, Spanish history, Casilaso de la Vega, he's the first one who adapts uh, Italian sonnet uh, tradition, and then and then others. So around her time, I mean, even men, Spanish men, Castilian men, barely writing things in Spanish vernacular. So when People talk about, you know, how uh, these three women, and especially there's Cartagena, uh, uses, takes advantage of male discourses. But these male discourses are actually, we are, I think we are referring to uh, more or less uh, the fathers of church, right? Who wrote in Greek or Latin or, you know, different languages, not in Spanish. So there are, if we, Think about it, there weren't that many uh, Spanish male writers who wrote in Castilian, right? So, um, I mean, can we talk, can we consider them, especially Teresa de Cartagena, one who wrote, you know, two, two works, so extensive works, um, unlike other women of mid medieval time. I mean, can we consider her some, someone like, I don't know, Casilaso de la Vega, who, who kind of modified uh, Italian sonnet tradition to uh, Spanish tradition. So um, what I'm saying is not, you know, not so much about uh, male discourse. I mean, yes, she, for sure, she, she's feminist. Uh, that's not, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, uh, downplay that side, of course, but at the same time, I mean, even, what I'm wanting to say, even male writers of Spain barely adapting uh, uh, religious or, or, or rhetorical writings of, uh, you know, spiritual treatise. And she's the one, like, uh, you know, pioneer in, in these type of writings, right? So, in a way, it, it is more important to recognize the her, the the what is the her as the, the the one who initiates this type of writing rather than just uh, uh, sort of like subversive and trying to be feminist and using male discourses because Spanish male didn't even use such discourses yet. So that was my comment and question. So I just want to hear about what you thought. I thank you. <laughs> That's exciting. Thank you for your comment question. Um, okay, first of all, I totally agree that these women should be valued in their own right and not in, in comparison constantly and in context with male discourse. 
However, I do think that we need to recognize that their own anxiety about writing would have necessarily meant that even if they are innovative and different, they were considering that that discourse was the discourse and that they were not did not pertain to it. And so that there was a self consciousness there in the moment of writing. Um, and you mentioned Teresa de Cartagena. Oh, I have so much to say. Thank you. I love that comment. Um, she over and over mentions her inability, her ignorance, her mujeril, like I forgot her actual terms, but the captatio, you know, where, she, where she's continually putting herself down in the same breath quoting scripture, um, you know, the Psalms, um, using Latin fluidly with no problem. She's obviously a totally erudite person, but she's continually putting herself down. So she's following the convention. She's following convention, even though uh, it's contrary, contrafactual. Um, that's one thing I would say. The other thing I think that is important is that there were, uh, like she's often, uh, recognized not for creating something new, but for having based her writing on something that's already been done. In fact, specifically in her case, I think it was um, Boethius or the cons uh, consolation. Um, what's it called? So it just went out of my head. But she's constantly it's constantly that she that she's not a creator, right? And I would argue that it's not a consolatory treatise at all. Her text, I don't think it is. I think it's very outward. It's very much I'm teaching you about how to better yourself. But you know, um, and so I agree with you, and I really appreciate that idea of recognize her recognizing Teresa and all three of the women actually as as total innovators in their own right, and not necessarily responding to a male discourse. But I think that that's the kind of like insipid aspect of male discourse is that it is, it wasn't male discourse, it was the only discourse. If you are a first women writer, the only language you have is the language of men to use. And that tension um within themselves even if it's not an outside force which is why i consider the outside forces the inside what what is this it's, it really is about issues that are very contemporaneous to now like self-esteem and you know um intention and voice and all of these things that we talk about so but i very much appreciate what you say and i think that ultimately we should get to the point where we're saying she was a total innovator and she was a first period she wrote about going deaf she you know made it very she she like felt very strongly about herself and her right to express herself and she felt that she was speaking you know that god was speaking through her and why can't we just recognize her for that so thank you i very much appreciated that comment and question and we we have more time for other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Professor Mosafari, go ahead, please. Thank you so much. It was a very interesting issue, but unfortunately, I don't have uh, much experience in both sides, not from the technological point of view and not from the content point of view, which you may refer to these three women. But anyhow, thank you so much. I It was very interesting issue for me also. Uh, I want to ask you, you are referring uh, to uh, language of man. I just, I want to know uh, what is what are the characteristic of language of man? Just, just uh, mentioning, not going in the detail, just few characteristic of language of men. So it's interesting also for me. That's, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, the question is, is discourse controlled by power, a power dynamic? I think that that's really the basis, basis of this, is that if you are speaking from a position of power, your voice has a different timber than if you are speaking from a position of inferiority um, and that is true not just for male versus female discourse that is also true i don't know if you're familiar with the theory of minor literature but there has there's been a lot said about a person writing for example not in their mother tongue not in their native tongue 
or a person um, like Shakespeare who was writing without a noble title, right? And the anxiety that that produces when you consider yourself um, not pertaining to the, the powerful group, how do, you, how do you garner authority? And so when I talk of when you're saying male discourse, what I'm really talking what I, when, when you say men's language, I'm really talking about male discourse. And what I'm talking about is the discourse of the powerful, the people that that were powerful, that were in charge. Um, Teresa, we were talking about Teresa de Cartagena. I mean, she was accused of plagiarism. And the accusation was that a woman couldn't write that way. So her, the accusation was that she was using male discourse which she probably was, but she wrote it. Mm -hmm. But uh, in fact, uh, uh, one thing uh, I am agree also uh, and emphasize on Professor uh, Song, uh, in fact, uh, we are talking about the period that uh, men and women equally, they uh, have been discriminated if we are talking about the power because the, they were, uh, they were uh, living under the religious uh, dogmatism in all in the other forms. I don't say uh, one form. For example, among the Muslims, also uh, the philosopher in 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 Andalusia, they were under the pressure, and also mysticism also were under the pressure, and only jurisprudential, uh, you know, ju jurists who were serving in the court, they could just uh, have any ruling. They could put a person in the prison and based on their ideology. And also later on, also we have during the Renaissance, also we have uh, courts uh, and uh, inquisition courts. And we have so at that time, men and uh, women both, uh, that means without any discrimination, they were under the pressure. I, so I, from I, this point of view, I want to say that uh, Professor Song, in fact, uh is right to say that we are uh, we have to you know make ourselves free from our environment that means cultural environment and we are the environment that we are living uh and the environment that those three women were living at that time let, let me let me suggest something to you mm -hmm. first of all i do recognize all three women as what i would consider double minorities mm -hmm. they are women but they are also, in the case of Teresa de Cartagena, she was a convert. She was from a family of converts. In fact, they believe that she was moved from a Franciscan convent to um, Las Huelgas in Burgos precisely because, Cistercian, because of the programs um, that happened in, in Toledo at the time. So they believe that the family was feeling that she would be safer in Burgos. So I'm not suggesting that there are not other social influences on their writing. But I was focusing on this commonality among the three. Isabel de Vienne, as I mentioned, was um, illegitimate and she had a challenge to her power specifically because of that. Um, it's documented in um, I think Miquel de Planas's ed edition of her work. And then Leonor de Lopez de Cordova was, fell out. I mean, her whole family fell out of favor. She was jailed for nine years. So she, she definitely suffered. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, but what I would post to you is that you're suggesting that there was no language, male language that these women could be writing against. And that's actually, I mean, in the case of Leonor Lopez de Cordoba, um, it wasn't contemporaneous to her. But if you read the chronicles about her, you can certainly see the antagonism that, that she suffered. But also Isabel de Viena had a very explicit relationship to um, Jaume Roig, who wrote The Spill, The Mirror, which was a horribly vindictive like diatribe against women, and not just women in general, nuns in specific. And the interesting thing about The Spill is about Jean Roig is that he was a medical doctor, which I think has something to do with his interest in his like condemnation of women. I believe it has something to do with, with the plague and the fears of that, that that possibly women and sin like had reaped this plague, but also he had donated money 
to Vienna's convent, and his daughter was a nun under Isabel de Vienna's tutelage. And we're talking about a man then who wrote in the vernacular, who was erudite, and who wrote against women. So if I were Isabel de Vienna, a well-read person who's you know this the father of a nun that i am in charge of has written this text it's very likely she would have written it i read it and it's very likely that she would want to respond and that's what i mean to say the sentiments don't change just because we are now versus then the feelings that hey that's not fair that doesn't change and i don't think we should ignore it um, and in the effort to preserve like that we're in this you know we're in the 21st century and that was the 15th century but those base feelings still exist. We have uh, some minutes for another question or comment. Probably a final question or a final comment. Uh, something that is interesting for me especially in digital humanities projects is the computational approach that we use. In my experience, when we try to, when I try to transform a print text to a digital text, there is a lot of difficulties. Uh, in my case, I usually have to clean the text. If, if, if it's a PDF, I have to clean a lot. And usually I work with 19th or 20th century uh books in the case i can see some pictures and the writing is very difficult can you explain a little bit how what techniques did you use to transform these books into digital text i'll just say very quickly um the um memorias is only uh, nine folios so 18 pages so that i was able to transcribe by hand um into xml um the uh, Arboleda de los Enfermos, same thing. It's about 50, 50 pages, more or less. So I could do that. The Vida Christi is 400. So it's the one that took me the longest, not because I was going to planning on transcribing, but it's also, it was also a published in Cunabula. It was an early book, an edition. So that was a little bit easier because it had a typeface, you know, type. Um, so I actually figured out a way to use Transcribus, which is a wonderful organization that um, provides free or very cheap um, um, optical uh, character recognition for text. So you upload your text and the computer reads it. There's a couple, there are a few like challenges to it. Like my challenges were the columns. It didn't recognize the columns and that took a very long time for me to figure out, which I finally did by telling the computer to recognize that it was an early printed book type, that it was um, to recognize type set i guess the, the the like clumps of print it finally recognized that it, there were columns and what the title was and the page so it worked out but it took like three months for me to figure that silly thing out it was very annoying uh but that's how i did those three and then adding in the tags is manual if i had a team of researchers that would be amazing i don't so it's just me so that's why it's not finished yet <laughs> Yeah, Thank for, you so unfortunately, we usually don't have a team. No, <laughs> not for <laughs> like this that. kind of thing, right? Yeah, usually in digital humanities projects, we show the final product, and there is a lot of work behind that. And um, it's like digital humanities labor, something that we do a lot in this kind of project. Uh, thank you so much again, Holly, for this compelling presentation. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>